thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invite from uh, Michael and Jess. Um, what I thought I'd, the idea of tonight was really to talk about uh, architects and engineers collaborating. Uh, I like project work because I think it tells us a lot about how we work and uh, the challenges that we overcome together. So I, I really like talking about this project because it, A, it had many challenges um, uh, and B, we had to work really, really closely together with our engineers partners. Um, Michael's given you a little bit of kind of background about me uh, and I think as an architect um, my greatest attribute is being open to the kind of dialogue and the conversations that I have with all my other professionals in, in the world. So that's allowed me to A, to understand your world uh, uh, but also for you probably to understand a little bit about mine um, and that'd be one my one kind of um, comment to pass on to you, idea to pass on is to be open to those conversations, to test and challenge each other, um, to not just think about your own world, but to think about the possibilities um, much wider. Because when you start to do that, you can create buildings that are uh, amazing, that inspire, uh, that really shift the boundaries of our practice. Um, so that'd be my challenge to you is to, to be open to, to that. So, uh, City Hall, uh, this project's almost 20 years old, so it's making me feel really old here. Um, but it's still incredibly modern. Uh, it was still groundbreaking at the time uh, and probably still groundbreaking now. And it tells us a lot about how we create buildings. Um, for us, architect architecturally, it is uh, a volume. You know, it's volumetric, it's 3D, it's spatial, it's f functional relationships and how they uh, come together. For the structural guys, it's obviously, for you guys, it's structural performance and holding the building up. Um, and, a, and in this case, incredibly complex shape. Uh, and there's many, many other layers. And I thought I'd just show you some of those other layers as well, because it helps inform our practice. Um, you, Again, I'm trying to widen your world uh, to think beyond just the st structural engineering uh, performance. And for me, think beyond beyond architecture. So, should we dive in? Let's dive in. So, City Hall, you may have seen it as part of the landscape of London. Um, it is right on London's kind of front doorstep, the Thames. Uh, it addresses the World Heritage Site of um, the Tower of London across uh, across the river, um, you can see Tower Bridge there. Um, it is right front and centre. It is the headquarters for the London government, London Council, and it was designed as an iconic building. So it challenged us right from day one. Uh, and this is me working at Foster and Partners, uh, working with Arabs as a full engineering team. So we as we came together as a team and, and a competition uh, to win this, but it was designed as iconic and challenging right from the outset. So we had to get in that mindset. And that's that context, that context of London, it's part of the city sky, city skyline and, and city context. And it's part of a much bigger master plan. So, but it all, all the avenues and views and shafts look towards it. So it's, it is that iconic building. It is that building that is uh, representing London coming together. So it's much more than just that building. And that was our competition winning scheme and it looks nothing like uh, what, what we actually eventually built. Uh, it was an idea, it was all about openness and government and we needed all of us uh, engineers and architects to, to buy into that. We did have this spiraling ramp um, and at the time we were doing the Reichstag in Germany, so thinking about the new German parliament and what that looks like and how you represent democracy and openness. Um, so again, what does a structure look like when you're representing openness and democracy? Um, so that's, the, you know, again, challenging back to every one of us in the design team. Then we went back to first principles and we actually said, um, you know, what are the things that we're trying to achieve out of this? We're trying to... Um, shift the, the cost of the building and not just the build cost, but the operational cost. 
Uh, we're trying to embed some sustainability in that. And we start with the form and the orientation rather than trying to shoehorn it in with some smart systems, um, make the building work for us rather than uh, yeah, buy a lot of expensive tech. So go back to first principles. It's all about shape, about that volume, about that 3D uh, uh, shape. Uh, and think about the sphere versus the square. Obviously, there's lots of challenges about that, um, not, not less structurally and, and um, uh, functionally around building um, how it works. But so we, we start to overcome that. We think about leaning back uh, against the sun to provide shading uh, and opening up towards the, in this case, the north light. For us, it's south. And really, really driving hard the idea about the energy footprint of a building. So you, you're starting from, you're trying to bring all of these competing principles together um, and think about uh, the, the program, the functional brief. There you go. Concept number one the blob um, and three toothpicks. Um, but it gets an idea, right? It's about trying to, and that evolves into thinking about the layering of the, of the functionality that's required in a city government. So you're starting to apply that into the shape. Oops. Jump too far. So you, your program is starting to get there. You've got, uh, you're leaning back against the sun, you're reducing your footprint. Um, yes, it's becoming a, a complex shape and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but you're also connecting in with the London aquifer. So you're using the context, you know, the ground beneath you and the water beneath the, in the ground to start to cool the building. Um, so there's a lot, the building is doing many, many things at many different levels. It's not just about one element doing one thing, it's actually multiple things. Uh, there are no, co no car parks, none. Uh, there's, um, I think the mayor didn't want a car park. And I think there's two disabled car parks as part of a, so the ground plane is given over to the public. Um, so you're thinking about that, you're thinking about how the building touches the ground. Oops, it's jumping around. Thinking about the footprint of the building. And now we've got this round footprint and I'll show you how we created that um, uh, as well. Um, so, if you've got an office, there's a hierarchy, somebody important gets an office, will actually know, in this case, uh, the offices are on the inside and the people are on the outside and they get the views and the sunlight and the air. So we, we've reversed the model again. Um, we did explore some crazy things like inclined cores, structural cores and inclined lifts and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, pull back a little bit from that. Um, but we were out there testing it, right? Um, thinking about how did that, that shape and that structure then support the building uh, and then give you vertical access. Thinking about layer upon layer about how do you then create that shape around that building. Um, and for a long time it was called the fencing mask. Uh, some people called it the glass testicle. It got all sorts of kind of monikers like that um, as we were exploring the shape and what it meant to be um, outward looking uh, towards the river. Public, openness, democracy, um, all those things in, in embedded in a building form. We went through m layers and layers and layers of modeling. Physical models are actually really important for ev everywhere. Uh, we were working with the engineers with uh, straws and bits of foam core just to build the model, the structural model. That was really powerful for us. We kind of physically, almost physically built it together. So think about that. Think about how you build things together in, um, in mock-ups and, and trials like that. It's actually a very powerful way of, of thinking about buildings and designing. And so at this point, it's actually become much more refined, uh, much more coordinated. The elements of the building start to come together. Again, this is just another model, a very 
uh, what they call pucker uh, in the UK, pucker model, um, you know, uh, high quality. Um, but models are really powerful tools. So a lot of us day to day just spend our lives doing nice rectangular buildings. And I got uh, rehabilitated on a nice rectangular building after this because I probably needed it. Um, but you, the tools and techniques and thinking and mindset around um, doing complex buildings is equally applicable to what you're doing day to day. So that'd be my, you know, think about that. Think about the rigor of what you're doing, how, how to set out a building, how to think about, how to think about that because uh, it, we created a nine-step geometrical process that defined every point on this building as a volume. Uh, and that started with, you know, we had all those kind of weird shapes and plasticine and then actually, well, it, we actually have to define it geometrically to be able to build it. So taking it to the next level, it's not just beyond in CAD these days or in using Rhino or Grasshopper, uh, you can create some amazing things, um, but can you build them? Can you actually translate that into, so we went through that process of translating into a geometrical standard. So three arcs defined this way, cut by planes that way, created uh, circles, which were, uh, each floor plate. And this is not going to work, is it? So this is a little script we ran to create the facade. So is this shape, this amazing shape, curved glass? Of course not. That would be insane. Um, is it actually a very carefully flat paneled facade? So it's again, thinking about the processes and Michael's just, sorry. Yeah, that's the right one. So very quick, you can actually create. So there's 660 panels. They're all different. Uh, they're all uh, slightly skewed. They Some tip, tip back and some tip forward, um, but they're all flat. So they're trapezoidal. And so you can actually develop a shape uh, like this. And you need to define each of the points, X, Y, Z. So X, Y, Z was actually our, our the whole purpose of the uh, using, using those geometrical models. Um, we went to nine decimal places just in millimeters because we were a bit crazy. And there was a little error um in there um, not that you needed to be that accurate but it was interesting um just trying to drive out inaccuracy right because once you're starting you create a one process and then a, you start another process and you're so reliant on that everything being correct so again it's a good lesson for you no matter if it's this shape or a nice rectangular box um, it really drives a, a, a way of thinking so we did that for every element in the building. So uh, this is concrete uh, lift cores, stair cores, and and toilets. Um, obviously, the steel form, uh, steel frame, an elliptical spiraling ramp, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, atrium glazing, skirt glazing. So the glazing at the bottom of the building, um, this sweeping diagrid and roof, um, and then each of the each of the office building, office uh, facades. And that comes together to create that shape. So it's quite complicated. And probably the worst element was this, we called it the snake, this kinking Z uh, interface between it. We kind of left it three and a half years. We kind of left it to the last half year to try and resolve. It was the most complex. Unfortunately, the embedded um, videos weren't working, so we'd, we're going to keep jumping out um, to look at them. But every aspect had to be analyzed and thought about. So in this case, it's a thermal model. So you've got this 
shape, it's responding. You can see the blue lines. That's actually shading, so it's the building self shading. And you can see uh, the light blue. That's the building facing to the to the north and the northern hemisphere. Um, and the red top. So we've reduced the top, reduced the heat load on the building. So that means we could do more uh, inside. Okay, speed up. To get heat load on the building, you understand everything about that that panel, that unitized facade panel. Um, and in theory, you could actually fine tune every single facade panel to respond to the um, the heat load. Um, we didn't in the end. We, but I'll I'll dive in and show you what we did do. So we thought about the envelope, the skin of the building and how it related to the interior of the building as well and the, actually about the thermal comfort of the occupants so, you know we're not just building buildings for the sake of it we're actually building buildings for people to use and uh, inhabit uh, and in this case um, we've used uh, aquifer water um, under london um, we use it as a cooling mechanism so um, constant temperature down here run it through a heat exchanger um, and chill beams in the ceiling uh, and run 100% fresh air through a plenum. So 100% fresh air means that we better cognitive function, people don't fall asleep in the afternoon, uh, um, cut down on your coffee, all sorts of good things. Um, but it's also a very passive way of heating and cooling, so a really positive way. Uh, and linked with the facade itself. So you can see... Uh, often buildings just sealed up, um, can't get any fresh air. This We have a little uh, opening window that short circuits um, the triple glazed facade. It's a really highly efficient facade system. Um, you open this little panel that operates an actuator. This opens above, you get a beautiful stack effect. It draws the fresh air through as much as London air is fresh. And so that's it in much more detail. You know, it's it's highly high performance in terms of thermal. It's got blinds in it, um, but it's operated by the individual whose whose desk is there. So it's it's got that human interface. We don't do many triple glazed facades here in New Zealand. Um, we might just get double glazed. We're lucky. Um, so you've got a unitized facade system. So that means you know glass, aluminium, all in one unit brought together, uh, uh, sealed up with uh, gaskets between them. Um, but each one of those is different. Uh, so we didn't give shop drawings or, or we gave the, the nine-step geometrical process to the facade manufacturer and said, go forth and work it out uh, and we'll test if you're right. So that was a different way of working um, with them. Uh, and to their credit, they came to the party. You know, we had some typical details about build up and what it was trying to achieve. Um, so they started with a whole lot of raw um, aluminum profiles. Each one of them gets a special barcode and gets tracked through the through the process. The whole factory cutting system, uh, those racks that you can see in the back is one window. Um, but each window, remember, is slightly skewed. So it's a kind of trapezoidal shape. Highly, highly complex, plus three layers of glass and actuators and all sorts of different things. So those are the windows that open because you have to be able to clean it. And you have to think about the brackets and how they sit on the floor and on the edge of the slab and how much tolerance you need uh, and how much movement. Uh, and so we created a universal bracket. So this is actually a sphere. Uh, it's a ball and allows 
the bracket universal ball and a universal socket to sit. So you do all your change in that element in here. And at the top, each of those allows a, as a slot and allows the brackets to, to move. So you get differential movement floor to floor. And so you take out all that. So you have to think, you have to think pretty, uh, pretty cleverly and intensely about all the kind of movement, particularly when it's the geometry is really complex like this. And you have to test it. Uh, and this is a Rolls Royce turbo prop engine uh, that you fire up to hurricane force winds and absolutely blast the hell out of uh, the facade to make sure that all the glass, all the gaskets and the seals and uh, are all working. And you have to test that you can actually open it and clean it because this is actually a 10 story building. Uh, I need to be able to get up there on this cherry picker, um, un unlock the, uh, the panel, it, the actuators kick in and it opens up and I can clean it. And this is the cherry picker. It wouldn't be me uh 10 stories up uh but purpose bought for this building to allow them to do that work oh this one works new yeah. okay so this kind of describes a little bit about the complexity of you can start to see the columns coming up uh there are two straight columns uh there are only two stories they're going at the bottom uh, that all the rest are on some kind of angle. Uh, the worst one is 41 degrees above horizontal. So it's more horizontal than it is vertical. Um, poor guys installing it, middle of winter, snow, trying to get their what is it, spodge hammers and spanners and get the bolts to line up. H horrific. Um, I think they're used to it. So structural frame, wire diagram, simple, right? Once you add the layers of steel on it and think about the complexity of uh, structural elements coming together, um, really complicated, really complicated. And then servicing that, uh, cladding that uh, as well. So when a building is on the lean, the more you put on it over as you build it, the more it starts to lean. So you actually have to allow for what they call slump. To, um, so the building's going to slowly, slowly, slowly get kind of heavy. So it will actually move and change. Um, so getting it accurate uh, and understanding all the tolerances was really, really critical from an architectural perspective around facade and envelope, but also for all the structural elements. So accuracy, uh, when you're building something like this, is fundamental. And it's not just about the facade and those, those four points, X, Y, Z, I showed you, it's, it's every element. So we had uh, the 3D laser um, surveyors on site in the steel factory up, up north. Uh, Halifax, um, uh, just everywhere. They would they basically made sure that every point on the building was within its tolerance. So when you're doing a really complex shape, accuracy is super important. X Y Z, yay! Only six decimal points. Oh. Because when you start to clad it, and you have to clad it symmetrically, otherwise it gets out of whack. Remember, it's just, uh, so you have to go left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, uh, and the building slowly starts to slump. Um, because each of those panels is different and it won't fit. So eventually you get this very, you know, quite smooth shape. It's quite raw inside, and you can see all the bracketry uh, here. That's all covered by a floor. But you have to allow for all of that to happen, um, and you have to allow for all the kind of all the structure up here. Uh, and you can just see um, each of the 
connections at the top head of the column is actually a cotton reel style uh, and that allows all of the horizontal beams to come in at multiple angles and all of the columns to come in at the bottom and at the top at at crazy angles as well so that was a, a kind of revelation for us as a team to work that through um, so we've looked at the office floor plates standard plates simple right um, this is the seven story atrium space uh, it's got a seven story diagrid on the outside that wraps over and becomes the roof um, and all sorts of complexity on an elliptical spiraling ramp stepped ramp so I'm, again i'm challenging you to think beyond um, what you're doing day to day but actually think about what we could do once we work together like this uh, and all of those elements have multiple purposes so i'm just again challenging you to think about structure beyond stru just structure or beyond just the envelope so a council chamber at the bottom 21 uh, councillors representatives of uh, greater london um, plus public seating a uh, beautiful elliptical um, <clears throat> shape in glass of course how will this work no so we started with this fantastic shape you know the plasticine blob again let's go all out let's create a flask a flask is beautiful let's make it in glass wrong one maybe it's that one no. thinking about acoustics um so when you sneeze in this flask <clears throat> watch the reverberations bang 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 so river acoustic um clarity is all about one reflection uh to, um, and so when you're getting a shape like that there's bouncing sound around like that multiple multiple times you, you wouldn't be able to hear a single thing in there <clears throat> absolute disaster so we ended up completely rethinking what we're doing using the underside of the suffetes and floor plates using the underside of this ramp uh, and absorbing all of that extraneous noise and that drove us to completely rethink the whole atrium strategy So you see that big diagrid there um, that's where it shifts from a kind of two-story module um, to the one-story office grid or office facade system and it was all about lights and the views across to the tower of london and the city of london so you felt connected um, but you got this incredible generous uh, structure but that structure is also heated so they're radiators so we the horizontal elements uh, have hot water running through them and that's because when you've got a big facade you've actually got a thermal delamination so the cold air is just coming down the, the face of that uh, inside glass uh, and you'll feel an incredible draft at the bottom uh, and the draft is by the mayor's seat uh, it was Boris Johnson it's now uh, Sadiq Khan um, so really uncomfortable down here so we actually said well let's use this structural element let's heat it and um, effectively we'll get a radiant effect all the way up what's that doing something weird just start from there <clears throat> and so you can see particularly at the top you know this is a structural model looking at um, um, deflection um, those really long members at the top are really taking 
uh, pretty difficult. Uh, and the other bit is, is at the bottom here where there's a super long span. This is the heat model of, uh, of that you know, really big section. And this is it getting prefabbed. So you have to think about then running all the pipes through this and how you make it in the factory, put it on a barge, uh, truck it to uh, and bring it back to, to London and, and get it off off the barge and in, into the site. They chopped it up into bits um, and then effectively pieced it all back together. Really big sections. At the same time as installing the, you know, uh, the spiraling elliptical ramp. So that's a completely different story in itself. So that is a box section, steel box. So it's a bridge. I give a bridge lecture to the University of Canterbury every year with um, Phil Gaby. Um, and it's got tune mass damping. So it's uh, con concrete steps, um, concrete weight on it, uh, and separated by bitumen. So the weight is meant to uh, reduce the vibration. So we were building this just after the uh, Millennium Bridge. So the disaster that was the Millennium Bridge that was just doing this kind of snaky thing because um, it didn't have enough damping in it. Uh, and so Foster's, again, Foster's and Arab, uh, we were never going to go there again. So we tested the hell out of this. Uh, and this we tested quarter sections of this ramp, it had a five ton weight on it. I would jump on it while all the engineers would look at their meters and because they had it all wired up uh, and see the vibration decay. So it was all about vibration decay. And then it, when it was finished, we architects and engineers all together trooped up and down in step um, in the ramp just to make sure that it was actually working. It was working, so that was good. Finally, some last pictures of it in um, finished. So this is a beautiful light, um, you know, the marriage of the diagrid structure in white, the really big um, uh, facade system, a spiraling ramp that goes, you know, allows the public to go past it. So you actually get to feel the structure. You can hug, hug the beautiful uh, bits of CHS. You're in that chamber and that chamber is light filled and um, uh, looks out towards the city so you feel connected into the city um, so again uh, envelope and and glass and structure all coming together you have this spiraling elliptical ramp above you um, integrated and in. you can just see the panels there with acoustic absorption in the bottom there is actually uh, lighting grids and, and cameras because uh, it's fully broadcastable. Um, very, very complicated shapes, as you can imagine. But again, a team that was really, really integrated. It was all about the vision for this and making it happen. It wasn't about, I can't do that. It'll be, it was more, how can I do that? How can we work together to make it happen? And it was a compromise uh, in all sorts of different ways. So I know a lot now about, because um, there's a lot of internal stiffness uh, and weld pulling, uh, changing the, the shape of the this flat um, curved section of, of the out, out of the box. So we looked like, a, looked like a hungry horse. It looked like its ribs were showing uh, just because of the in, tiny, tiny um, pulling of the web. Um, uh, so pulling of the you know against the stiffness through that that um, welding process. So I learned a lot, uh, and it's actually a building that's partly underground, which you probably don't actually un get a sense of. But you know, creating that, creating it all on a basement, um, and again, its building is still is all about light. You can see that the photo on the the, the top right there is actually underground. And Ken Livingston at the time was was the mayor, and he he thought it was great to have this amphitheater for riots and protesters to protest outside the front door. Um, so we 
created the whole landscape and carved into the into the ground and into the basements. And the bottom of the building perfectly fits the model of London. We didn't know that at the time, but we it's it meant to be, so that's great. Um, I set out every uh, curve in the elliptical mirrored ceiling um, by hand. I set out the every faceted glass panel in the balustrade to make sure that there were even distribution of um, glass rather than chopping and changing from you know one size to another size to another size. So it was that attention to detail that's important. And you get this incredible effect uh, inside. Every step has integrated lighting in it. So you know, either the structural engineers, we had to talk about light, you know, lighting conduits and all that kind of stuff as well. Uh, and that goes all the way to the very top where the steepest turn. We actually found the night before it was due to get manufactured that it didn't fit. So uh, we had to redesign that last curve overnight to make sure there was enough headroom uh, to the one below. Um, it's, it, within all the constraints of a very tight, uh, really complex ge geometry. And that's when, you know, a team comes together and it's not just about you know the architect or one one party fixing it everyone jumped in and fixed up and this is quite, what's called london's living room um it's where jacinda and justin trudeau had their photo shoot when they were in london um it's it's a function space the idea is that the public have the top of the building not the mayor has the top of the building, public has the top of the building. So it's kind of reversed the whole idea. Uh, and you can start to see the shape of the diagrid come back out uh, and over the over the roof. So that was, actually, that was the only thing, yeah, that's twisted is this mesh eyebrow. So the only thing we couldn't get to flat panel properly was this mesh. And so we went for mesh because it allows you to twist it. But you have a balcony that lets you look out into London and, and enjoy the view. And we looked at crazy things like covering the whole thing in photovoltaics because it was supposed to be uh, a, a leading sustainable building. Um, and, it, and it was at the time as Briam uh, uh, level six. Um, but the idea was to go the extra mile to tell the rest of the world that actually you should be generating power on your own buildings uh, and we as the city council should you know the council should show you the way and they've actually now installed um, uh, photovoltaics on the roof so we allowed the weight in the structural uh, frame um, we didn't have this beautiful see-through roof uh, it would have overheated and been crazy um, but the idea was there and we allowed it to happen we thought about it in the you know it needs to happen in the future. Let's allow for it in the in the structural loadings. So you get this incredible building at night. Uh, even just the th just thinking about painting, what does the back wall color look like? Because that's important. It helps to orientate you. It punches the building out at night. It just glows completely. Uh, you can see that spiraling ramp um, in there. It's become a kind of icon of of London because of that. And you know you've made it uh, when Lego Land rings up and says, "Can we have the plans of the building? Uh, we'd like to put it at Windsor." So I sent the plans, and <laughs> so I dare you to try and make that in Lego. That was pretty complicated. Or the last ignominy is. When it becomes a cake, <laughs> um, and uh, the mayor gets to cut it at the opening. Anyway, that's me. What I thought I'd do is show you a project where architects and engineers kind of went beyond themselves, didn't have any barriers or boundaries about their practice, and we're all thinking about uh, delivering a project in a completely different way. 
So it's all about the vision about that project. I kind of challenge you to, to be that open, uh, to take that into your own practice. Um, and I look forward to seeing what comes out of it. Thank you. Happy to take questions. I'm going for time. I've got a lot of respect for what you guys do and how hard it is. Um, you know, we throw crazy things at, sometimes at, at you. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, and, and the ability to kind of work collaboratively is really important rather than doing it in a linear process. Architects tend to just kind of think iteration, design, iteration, design, iteration. Um, and I think engineers... It's a terrible gross generalization. Uh, uh, we've got one way, and this is, you know, it's a linear process. And I think uh, for architects and engineers to understand each other um, is to kind of understand that there are different mindsets that are happening. So we're constantly evolving the shape. As you can see, we're constantly evolving the relationship and functions of spaces, uh, and then trying to get a structure that fits it. And you're just going, just give me the plan, right? Um, Whereas we're thinking perhaps in three dimensions, um, thinking about yeah different things. So understanding the way each other works, um, but also being open and communicating. Right? I need I need to understand this, or what are you trying to achieve with that? Um, yeah, it can be really powerful. I think you, you could achieve the same result with, with others. It, it's as much about their mindset. You know, Arabs have a, they've created a culture, a, a mindset about innovation, um, uh, and that seems to imbue everything that they do. Um, we had the A-team, literally, uh, you know, and, and rightly so, because um, we were really out there pushing the boundaries. Um, but then they were, they could... You know, the, those acoustic models, they'd send it to New York overnight and they'd run all this complex stuff. And so they had all this amazing uh, access to specialists and stuff like that. Um, it helped, but I think it was as much about their mindset, the ability to collaborate and innovate. This is actually a really cheap building, surprisingly, for what you get. So this was, um, at the time, uh, just over 4,000 pounds a square metre. So in Lon building in London uh, for a building of this size was actually quite good value. Amazing, really. Uh, we ran this on a fast track process as well. So you, you, know, you often get, um, you think, how can earth could you do that? Surely you needed even longer. Actually, we needed, we, we had a short time. They booked the queen in and then <laughs> for the opening. And then we, we kind of built to that program because there wasn't even a mayor at the time. Uh, Maggie Thatcher had just established the whole thing. So we, we had a new client, didn't even know what they were building. Um, so we created a, a different model, construction model called construction management, where you're effectively designing and building with the builder and the subcontract, specialist subcontractors. And so have, working alongside the facade engineers, working alongside the steel fabricators, um, again, it changes your mindset, breaks down barriers between you know, d design and constru construction or disciplines. Uh, you're thinking about a different way. So we sat as a as a design team and a construction team in a porter cabin for two years on site, 
uh, we were on level five, we were really fit. <laughs> there was no lift. Um, uh, but we had all of that team together. Makes a huge difference. Um, it was about a year, 18 months of design and then two years of construction. Yeah, I mean, this this is this is a project where I shifted from a package architect looking at elements of a building to uh, blossom into an architect who can take an entire building. Or I, I moved on to master, you know, big scale master plans and a um, whole series of buildings, and some of them were nice and rectangular. Um, it, it it is very difficult. Uh, I think everyone went into that process knowing that it was a iconic building. It was a different kind of project. Um, I don't think we lost money on it, um, but I don't know the financials, how it worked out. Thanks for coming and um, sharing yeah. some information with us. Um,